everybody. My name is Esther. I'm part of our Science from Scientists team here in California, and I'm here to talk to Simone. Uh, you may have met her before. She was engaging about sharks last Friday, um, but I wanted to talk to her about something that I'm a little bit curious about myself. It's something that impacts all of us and that I don't know a lot about, but she does. So I'm going to ask her some questions and we're just going to talk about the state of our oceans and what's going on there and how it might impact people. So my first question, Simone, is I've heard that our ocean fisheries are kind of um, a mess right now, that things are going poorly. Can you set the scene for me a little bit? Tell me a little bit more about what the problem is, why it's a mess, what's going on? Sure. Uh, so one of the problems with uh, seafood in general is it suffers from the out of sight, out of mind challenge and that the ocean isn't our natural environment. We don't necessarily see, we don't have good data on the status of a lot of um, populations. So it's a big issue and it's one, a lot of people have that mentality of fish don't have feelings or there's an infinite supply of fish. So there's definitely a big disconnect, which I think is a big part of the challenge. Um, and then in terms of fish are some of the last wild caught or hunted um, things that we still eat. Mm -hmm. and so we're definitely overfishing a lot of species. We have already overfished a lot of species. There's a lot of challenges around health in terms of cons consuming things that have contaminants in them, um, things that haven't been tested. We don't know the synergistic, meaning the combined effects of things that we're adding into our oceans. There's huge challenges with things that are being mislabeled. Um, so there's a, a lot of challenges we have to face, but a lot of really great minds that are working on addressing each of those challenges as well. So when you say overfishing, that does it mean exactly what it sounds like? Great question. Yeah. So it basically means taking too many resources out of the oceans. There's not a, enough individuals to repopulate for future generations. So if we take too many, for example, breeding individuals out, then we won't have enough offspring, won't have enough babies so that they can have babies in turn. And so if we keep taking too many out of the environment, eventually we will run out. Nobody um, so to have babies anymore. <laughs> we won't have babies and then we won't have adult fish either. Oh dear. Well, babies are kind of loud and annoying, but we kind of need them too, right? We do, we do. Especially people that do enjoy uh, eating a lot of these seafood sources, which is millions and millions of people around the world depend on seafood for their primary protein source. So it's not an issue that we can address by eliminating fish from our diet. And a lot of fish provide a really important uh, important part. They provide really um, brain healthy omega-3s, some healthy fatty acids, things like that. So they can be really, really good to include in your diet if done responsibly. So tell me more about like, I, I don't like to eat fish a lot myself, but my husband does, my mother-in-law does. How can we, given that everything's is being overfished or is everything being overfished? Is there something that we can eat without feeling guilty about it? Yeah, there are a lot of really great options out there. Um, and I, I'm really happy to say that there are a lot of really great resources, both here in the United States as well as abroad. Um, I know here in the United States, something called the Seafood Watch, which is a free resource online. They have hard copies as well as an app. Um, so something you can take when you are out and about, say at a restaurant or at a market. Um, and you can oh. reference if you are... With the app, would I just take a picture of my food? Like, how, how does that work? Do I need to tell it like this is a blank? Yeah, so you'd say I want to buy shrimp, a very popular seafood option. Um, hopefully the label would have some information about where it was from, how it was harvested, because um, there's two main camps, wild caught or um, farmed. So uh, the more information you have the better and then you can look it up and then it will give you a breakdown, a color coding, green being the best, yellow being okay, and red being recommend you avoid eating for health and or sustainability issues. So I want to do this before I order or before I buy something at the supermarket. Correct. Um, so if you have the opportunity either at the supermarket um, or at a restaurant, you can also ask the waiter. That's something that's also really important because then the waiter can go back to the chef and that signals to the people that run the restaurant, this is an issue that people care about. They care about where their food comes from. I'm really shy. Is there, do you have a like recommendation for how to 
make it easy to ask the waiter. I feel bad because he has so he or she has so many things to do. I don't want to take up their time, but I guess I know it's important. Yeah, um, that is something that I would often offer to be that one at the table that would ask. So if there's maybe somebody else at your table who you're with that is more comfortable, um, I think there's definitely ways to approach um, whoever your server might be and to ask, do you happen to know where this particular shrimp or salmon or whatever the type may be is from? Um, they may or may not know, but I think just asking is a really, really important step um, and a really powerful action that we can all try and do more of. Okay, so get over my shyness, ask the waiter. Um, are there some general fish that it's safe or is it just something like I have to, for each individual fish, I need to figure out where it's from and that'll tell me if it's safe? Yeah, it's very tricky um, because as I mentioned, there's no kind of overall farmed is better than wild caught, for example, because it does very much depend on what country is doing it, the individual operation. Um, but a good rule of thumb, the bigger the species, the more contaminants it tends to accumulate. Um, for example, tuna tends to accumulate um, different contaminants like PCBs and mercury in the fatty tissue. Um, so that large species- It builds up mercury in its cells? Not a great thing. Um, mm -hmm. And your body can naturally get rid of that, but if you continually eat that on a regular basis, then your body doesn't have the time to get rid of those contaminants. Um, so there's certain groups that are more vulnerable, pregnant women, young children, for example, women that might want to get pregnant. Now there's new research about how it affects men's fertility. Um, so you don't have to cut it out of your diet, just be mindful about how much you're consuming. So like a lot of things, moderation is amounts, <laughs> moderation, okay. I can I can do that. Um, you said that it's complicated with farms um, and I'm sort of curious I've heard that farms can be good and I've heard that farms can be bad and you know you see like farm caught sam farm raised salmon all the time. Can you tell me a little bit more about why it's complicated and farming isn't always good because we think about farming um, as increasing crops and not in the ocean so I feel like I don't, I don't understand why that's bad, and I want to, I want to know why that's bad. Yeah, that is a great question, one that many other people often ask. Uh, several issues that could happen with farming is the effluent meaning the runoff. When you have so many individuals kept in a small space, they produce a lot of waste. That waste has nitrogen in them. So if it's in an open pen, for example, in the ocean, all that nitrogen being added to the ocean can lead to something called algal blooms, which leads to eutrophication, which essentially starves that environment of oxygen, which is necessary. So that could be a really destructive thing for the environment directly around that farm. Um, Wait, let me break that down. So the fish poop out stuff with nitrogen in it, poop. and the algae, not exactly. Okay. Try, let me try again. No, you got it, you got it. <laughs> I got it, I got it, okay. And the algae like to eat, well, they use nitrogen to grow, and so they can grow faster. And when, they, when there's a lot of growth of the algae, they use all the oxygen in the water, and then everything else dies, including the algae? It can, yes. So lots of different things need to happen, but that is one pretty bad outcome that can come um, that they've seen in areas directly around, they call it open pens um, in the ocean. Okay, so farming in an open pen in the ocean sounds like a bad idea. Can be bad, yes. Um, other things that they've found, for example, if you have a lot of individuals in a small space, things like disease can spread pretty quickly. Um, oh, we're seeing so that <laughs> lately. They have to uh, often pump the fish with a lot of antibiotics, which then we consume as we eat the fish. Um, so depending on what we want to be putting into our bodies, what are the long-term health impacts of that? Um, something to think about. So if what we're eating is full of antibiotics, that means that our bodies might have antibiotics in them. And you'd think that would be good, right? It, antibiotics, no bacteria will grow. But I've heard that the more you sort of low grade expose your bacteria to antibiotics, the less the stuff when you really have a bad infection, like you're really sick, the less that that stuff is gonna work. Is that the general problem with our fish having antibiotics inside of them? 
certainly one of them. Um, and I don't know if they use the same antibiotics, fish and humans. Um, and so one of the other challenges is we haven't had enough time to test what are the long, long-term effects of adding these things to our bodies. Um, so there's a, a giant unknown we're kind of conducting uh, as we go, conducting a giant experiment. <laughs> That doesn't sound like a good plan. It sounds like someone should have um, gotten approval to conduct this experiment on us. <laughs> yeah, well, you always have to balance the needs of um, we have to feed our populations. Um, we are running out of a lot of species. A lot of them have been overfished. And so people are trying to find alternatives. Um, something, for example, like bluefin tuna, very popular seafood choice. We have overfished a lot of bluefin tuna, and so now there's a lot of organizations that are trying to think about how can they farm bluefin tuna um, so that we can have an ongoing source. Um, and so it's balancing the demand, um, but also the environmental impact. Okay. So it sounds like we just don't know at this point if farming is better in terms of the impact on the oceans than wild caught or am I misunderstanding that? Yeah, it's a, it's, there's no clear cut answer. Um, it depends very much on the species, depends who is doing it and where it is being done. Um, and so, for example, salmon, um, generally, um, we do have wild Pacific salmon. There's not really a lot of wild Atlantic salmon. And so a lot of the salmon, if you get it, that doesn't say wild Pacific is farmed. Um, and one of the other challenges with farming and salmon in particular is the input output. So the general idea is about five pounds of feed for every one pound of salmon that's produced. So that's not a very balanced equation. Um, so we're spending a lot of energy and resources trying to feed the salmon and we're not getting as much protein out of it. Um, so it's not a very sustainable equation. Is that better or worse than cows? Because I know cows have a pretty bad input output as well. Uh, I haven't seen the direct stats, actually, um, so I, I can't compare the two directly, but it's not great. <laughs> not great. Okay, so running with that idea, you said that the lower down in the food chain that we eat seafood, sort of the, the better, and I guess that would line up with that, what you're talking about, input and output? Yeah, so things, um, your filter feeders like oysters um, tend to be pretty sustainable seafood source. Um, I know we're really lucky here in California. It's definitely part of the public mindset is to think about sustainability. So there are a lot of companies um, that are working towards that, which goes back to our earlier point in the conversation. A lot of people here ask for sustainable seafood. It is something people care about. Um, the other challenge is sustainable seafood can be more expensive. Um, mm. So people might have more of an expendable income to spend on things like this. Um, but we all have to start somewhere. So asking a question is a free thing that we can all do, um, whether we all can afford to take the next step of actually changing our purchasing behavior. Okay. Another. That makes sense. Is there, I know I can ask in a restaurant, is there anybody or any way I can sort of make grocery stores more aware, um, even if I can't actually change my purchasing choices, that I'm interested in more sustainable sourcing? Uh, one of the great things that's happening now is a lot of labeling on packages. Um, there's an organization called the Marine Stewardship Council, MSC, and they have kind of a blue fish label on there. Um, I know certain grocery stores will list the Seafood Watch card, their rankings, um, and they said, we're committed to sourcing our seafood sustainably. Um, so there's a lot of grocery stores that have already started this process. If you have the option to go to the counter, the seafood counter and ask, again, just can start the conversation. The more people ask, the more they'll bring it to their higher ups and say, this is something our customer base cares about. Uh, okay. But again, depending on where you are, you may or may not have access to different kinds of seafood as well. Right. But I can always, if I'm going to buy seafood, I can ask at the counter, at least ask the question about the sourcing and see if I can afford something that's more sustainable. Definitely. And then not to add a wrench into that, um, oh <laughs> one of the other challenges we're seeing is mislabeling. Um, I think it was about one in five um, of tested fish were mislabeled, meaning it said it was something and it was actually something else. Um, so often it's labeled as, say, wild Pacific salmon and it's actually farmed salmon. Um, so that impacts the health and the sustainability. So you could be trying to do your best buying sustainable options or what you think is sustainable, 
but it ends up being something else. Um, so just something else to be aware of. Um, and if you happen to catch it or you can recognize the difference, that's something you can let that restaurant or that seafood provider know. What, as a consumer, can I do to combat the mislabeling? Because I don't know, looking at a piece of salmon, I'd be like, it looks like salmon. I can't tell the difference between farm salmon and wild caught salmon. Is there anything I can do as a consumer to address that? Or should I just do my best with the world as it exists? Uh, I think you do your best. There are people that can discern the difference in the taste and the color. Um, if you're not as familiar with the difference, then that's okay. I'd say just do your best. Um, we can try as much as we can and then collectively we can each do what we can. You can let somebody know this does taste a little bit different than the last time I had salmon, for example. Um, and maybe somebody else in your group, if you happen to be with somebody else, will know. But I wouldn't worry too much about having to do everything yourself every time you have a piece right. of fish. That something. can be overwhelming. Yes. Do we have professional fish tasters the way that we have professional wine tasters mm -hmm. who sort of verify the vintage and all that kind of stuff? Like I know there's a lot about wine has to meet certain standards. Do we have similar professionals working with fish who can, who would have these, who have developed these tastes? That would be kind of a cool job. Yeah, I know, um, for example, with sushi, because so much is raw, um, that they, it's part of sushi culture to get really high quality seafood. And so people that are sushi connoisseurs could probably discern the taste. Um, but I haven't heard of such a thing, doesn't mean it doesn't exist here. <laughs> um, but certainly your high end restaurateurs would probably know better. <laughs> I wonder if they train sushi chefs in recognizing different fish by taste. That would be pretty cool. I would imagine so because so much is about the purity and the flavor and how it pairs with some of the other ingredients. Um, All right. So if you know a sushi chef, they might be your best source. <laughs> they might be your best bet. Or if you happen to know a, a good sushi restaurant, um, you can probably trust the seafood that they have there. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes if places are actively sourcing sustainability, that is something they're going to advertise. Um, and so it's not something you'll probably have to dig too hard to find. If they don't mention it at all, more than likely that's not something that their purchasers are focused on. I gotcha. That makes sense. Um, what about, so we said oysters were low level food feeders. What are some other low level things that are probably safe? Yeah, some of your smaller fish, things like sardines, um, squid are pretty great. Um, I know here Dungeness crab, although a few years ago they recently had some challenges, some uh, health issues with some of the crabs. So it's always good to stay alert, read articles. Um, check that seafood app. Check that seafood app. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, typically smaller things. Um, in science, it's hard to blanket statement anything because there's always exceptions to the rule. But um, yeah, just shrimp can be a bit of a mixed bag. Um, I love it, shrimp. Tell me more about why I shouldn't love shrimp. <laughs> some shrimping operations, um, as we talked about all that waste, the poop that all the shrimp produce, oftentimes they have these large ponds and then they will just pipe all of that poop directly into an open water source, which is not Oh, that great. sounds bad. Um, or the shrimp can sit in that waste material, which also isn't great. They've done some testing and found a lot of fecal matter in shrimp. Um, so again, that's something we always want to be ingesting. Oh dear. <laughs> so, so the shrimp that I love has probably got poop in it. Maybe not, depending on where you're getting it. Um, different countries also have different health standards, environmental standards. Um, so in terms of if you're getting imported, it, you know, can add another layer of complexity to things. Okay, so it may be good, it may be okay, it may be covered in poop. You just, you have to check this, the app to find out about your shrimp. Rolling the dice. And again, if you're having it occasionally, it, it's not gonna hurt you, our bodies are good generally it's staying healthy. Um, and so the issue I think is if you're regularly consuming fish or for example, shrimp every single week, that wasn't really healthy, that could be bad for you. But if you don't have it that frequently, it's probably not going to have the same impact. So like twice a month, we're probably fine. Yeah. Twice a week, not so much. And again, it also depends on if you're in those vulnerable 
demographics. Um, so young children, 12 and under, should definitely have um, less of certain high risk seafood and more of certain types of things um, that have um, like omega-3 fatty acids. Um, to which, grow good brains, right? For those brains, yeah, rapidly developing brains. Yay, brains. <laughs> we love brains <laughs> while well, using our brains. <laughs> Let's, yeah, no eating brains. <laughs> what about, so you said there have been in the past issues with the crab health. What about lobster? I know it's a big um, delicacy. I, I want to know more about sort of what's going on with our lobster fishery. Yeah, lobster is uh, pretty good. I think there's one area of the United States that they don't recommend getting lobsters from, but other than that, I think U U.S. lobsters are pretty um, a good option um, overall. Um, so they're filter feeders, right? So they eat like tiny little plankton mm -hmm. bits. So we're pretty low on the food chain. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And is crab similar for the most part because they're sort of eating similar things? Yep, generally. Um, yeah, I haven't heard of too many issues with crabs. Um, so I think you're generally good, but, you know, because things yeah. change all the time, all the recommendations, and if there, for example, one year there's a massive um, illness that cuts a huge portion of the population, then we don't want to put extra pressure by consuming a lot of that species the following year. Um, so it's always good just to check the app so that you do have the latest information, the scientists that are the ones on the ground constantly reading and checking up on the latest science. Um, okay, anyway. that makes that makes sense. Um, so generally, the lower on the food chain I can eat, the better specifically i should always check the seafood app and we'll link that um in the description for our videos so that anybody interested can find it easily for themselves um what other recommendations or like big picture things um do you want to emphasize for people who are trying to learn more about this problem and really want to be thoughtful about the way that we um, approach resources from the ocean yeah, so I'd say, just to reiterate what we've already discussed, I think asking when you're at a grocery store or at a restaurant is a really powerful, important step. Um, signaling that this is something that customers care about um, and this idea of voting with your dollars, you're gonna spend things that, spend your money on things that you um, think are valuable. In this case, sustainability is one aspect of that value. Um, so asking questions, trying to source things um, with the app when possible, but also understanding that, you know, you can only do your best. It's okay if you're out to dinner and you don't happen to know and you want to get that shrimp dish, that's all right. Um, also think about frequency, how often you're having seafood. Um, I know a lot of folks that don't eat meat tend to eat fish, so we just don't want to make sure that we are offsetting our impact um, onto the oceans that we were from agricultural areas. I gotcha. So maybe being a piscatarian is not solving as many problems as we think it is. Just want to be mindful and think about maybe some of the reasons people tend towards vegetarianism, health issues, and environmental issues also apply to the ocean. Okay, so fish have feelings too, and <laughs> we are learning them. a lot more about how fish do have feelings that they do have sensations. Um, in that sense, oh, um, but more so they're important for an ecosystem balance. Of course, but but I want to know more about those fish and their feelings. What what are we learning about them that we didn't know before? Uh, in terms of their response to stimuli um, and how that they, we thought that they don't necessarily feel things in the same way as like we would feel a pinch. Um, and now we're thinking that they do have a lot more feeling than we realize. Why did we think that, I guess, there must have been a study where they didn't respond to a pinch or a poke the same way that mammals did. Was that the sort of original fish don't have feelings? I honestly think a lot just comes from that idea of they look so different. It's such a different environment that they're so far from us that they don't have feelings, that it's, it's easy to disconnect, easier to disconnect from fish. They don't, we can't anthropomorphize them as much as we can other things that might look more familiar to us or we have maybe more of an emotional connection to. So we decided they didn't feel things because they weren't cute and cuddly? Uh, I would think so. I think that's a large part of it. <laughs> well, that's sad. 
<laughs> I, I bet like base, like fish have to know three-dimensionally around themselves what's going on with the water currents. I, I imagine that requires a lot of sensor, sensory ability on their body. Like when the wind blows and you can feel like your little hairs moving in the wind. Um, I imagine like their whole body is like that for water currents. I, I, I kind of like just thinking about it, imagine that the fish feel more than we do. Yeah, I mean, they definitely need to have different kinds of senses. Um, they don't necessarily have the same kind of awareness as far as we know, <laughs> but right. we're definitely learning more all the time. I'm constantly fascinated watching episodes of Planet Earth focusing on the oceans, what fish can do and everything that they they go through to survive day to day in the ocean. It's pretty cutthroat out there. <laughs> like lots of natural environments, very cutthroat. Indeed. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Um, maybe because I got on a tangent about fish and their feelings. Can you say one more time our takeaways for us? <laughs> sure. So some of the best things that you can do to help make sure that you limit your impact um, on the ocean is asking questions, trying to figure out whether the seafood that you're about to buy at the supermarket or order at the restaurant is sustainably sourced and doesn't have a lot of contaminants like mercury and PCBs. Um, just trying to be mindful about the frequency, how much you are also consuming of seafood. Um, and also talking to other people, let them know this is an issue. I love it. I am now disturbed about the poop in my shrimp. <laughs> Don't be too disturbed. <laughs> but it's, it's good. It's a, it's a good way for me to self-select against eating shrimp. Um, so that, that image will stick with me. <laughs> Great. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Simone. And next time, maybe we'll talk about something uh, that affects a different part of our ecosystem or a different part of our environment. Love it. Can't wait to learn more. <laughs> Yay! Bye for now.